Okay. I think at least we haven't covered actually new content here. This is mostly just revising. And we just come to the most important slides. Uh, yeah, and we said there's two, and some of the channels are good for ordered attributes, and the other ones are good for categorical attributes. And these are listed up to the left, which is ordered attributes, and to the right is categorical. And these are the orders from the most effective ones to the least effective ones. <clears throat> And so the position is usually the most effective ones to represent ordered attributes or quantitative or numerical ones. And then again, between the positions, if you have the common scale in the sense you have the same starting point and the lens represents, say, the same scale in the sense and they represent the same amount of value for the same unit distance as the most effective one. And you can have unaligned scales where the start point is not the same, still very good. And then the other ones, you can use the lens, tilt, or angle, and area, etc. So these are the ones you probably should avoid in the sense they're closer to the bottom of the list. That means they are not very effective. And then on this side, we have the <clears throat> attributes that could be good for representing categorical values, or sorry, categorical attributes. And so you can, the most effective one is region, and the next one is color, motion, or shape. So I guess, uh, actually motion will be slightly difficult to do, especially for example, in the software like Tableau, unless you write your own code. <clears throat> and then the special region is very effective, but also there's always a competition between <clears throat> this channel, special region for categorical attributes or the position for the ordered attributes. So essentially, if we use the position for some ordered attributes, then you can't use that to show categorical again because the position is representing uh, some values, for example, price or profit. And it's the same here. If we use the position to represent a categorical attributes, for example, the type of the product. And then you can't use that to represent any other values. So that's become comes a talk and design choice. So you have to make a decision which attribute is more important and you give it to that attributes. For example, in your analysis, and maybe the amount of price, so amount of profit is the most important thing. And then you probably will choose use the position to represent the price and use some other attributes like a color or maybe shape to represent the product type. But for example, if in your case, uh, the location of the, say the store is most important or the type of the product is most important, then you may want to use special region to represent as a product type. Then you have to use other, um, other channels to represent say price or profit say using lens or size, for example. So that's the, essentially the, the fundamental task. When you design a visualization, you have to decide which attribute is most important and select the most effective channel for that attribute. And then it goes on to the next attribute and go on and go on. Okay, and we also, in the last week, and uh, we went through this quite quickly. So we're going to do a review here as well in terms of some of the rules of sums. And so this is kind of like a guidelines. People based on experience say these are usually the good thing to do, but they are less, less strict compared to, for example, the order of the list here. So this is almost always true, whereas these rules of sums are true in most cases, and in some cases it might be different. And the first first one is says no unjustified 3D, and don't just use 3D because it looks fancy or interesting, and it has its own challenges when to, when you try to represent data with 3D. And for example, the depths and is not very good at representing numerical values. And if you can see here say depth is roughly here when you use depth to represent a numerical value 
so it's not very effective. You would have occlusion, means things in front will block the things behind. And then you have perspective distortion, so uh, the things in the front would appear to be larger compared to the things behind. Even they are the same size, just purely because it's 3D, the things further away from you appear smaller. And then we as humans have to mentally adjust. For example, here, the blue bar probably is visually bigger than the purple bar, but we need to visually judge, say, is this difference purely caused by the distortion? Or so they should be the same? Or is even if you consider the distortion, still the blue should be bigger than the purple? So that just would usually affect how people can accurately get the information from the visualization. Okay, uh, next example is about eye beats memory. And so this is mostly the example we use is to showing a temporal data in the sense the data changes over time. And the particular example, if you remember, and it's showing a flight animation of the older flights between the two continents, between Europe and the US. So start from certain time, you can see these lines, each line represents a flight moving from, say, Europe to America or the other way around. While it's very interesting to look at, the problem is, and later on, if I want to ask you, um, what does the flight situation looks like at a particular time, say 10, 30 in the morning, it's quite difficult to remember. Whereas if we just visualize what the situation is at all different times, it's much easier to see. So you don't have to remember it, which is, can be difficult. Okay, uh, next one is about resolution over Im immersion. So immersion here mostly meant to refers to technology such as virtual reality. And the reason is in virtual reality, you have to render two views, which are almost identical for both of your eyes. So one for each eye, as you can see here. There is very small differences between these two, which is simulate how you can see from your left and right eyes. So the image we see from left and eyes are not completely identical in the sense, just because there's a small angle difference between where you look at. So you have small differences. And to achieve the same results in virtual reality, that means you have to split your display into two parts. You can only use half of it to actually show the information. The other half cannot show any new information. So it's just a re-representation or re realization of exactly the same information with slightly differences. And as a result, you only have you can only really use half of the display. So sometimes that may be too much a cost because otherwise you can show something which is not in vir virtual reality, but use the entire display area. Again, so this is not always, uh, how do I say, always correct. And for example, sometimes maybe in some cases and being in, in the, the feeling in actually real in, in the environment is more important than showing more information. And in those cases, maybe can justify using virtual reality rather than just say, do a 2D display. And so next one is a general approach. When you have too much data, you cannot show them effectively in a one visualization. So the examples we use is the Google map. And so the general approach will be, say, overview first. So for example, you're providing, sorry, an overview here. And allow people to zoom and filter. So obviously people can change their zoom levels on the Google map, or you can say pan to see different places and details on demand. So people, if it's really interesting certain things, people can click on a location, for example, one of the cities, and then Google will pop up a message to show the details about this uh, particular place. So that's one of the way to show when you have lots, lots of data, which you cannot show all the details at the same time. <clears throat> um, okay, yeah. So we have seen this one already a few times, but today 
I'm um, just really want to say. So now we're starting to go into the the how part of the what, why, and how framework. And in the how part, we're going to talk about depends on different data set types. And these are the main ones we have. And today we're going to look mostly look at the table one, which is probably the most common data set types, and also the one you'll be using in your coursework. This and um, different ones designed for the other type of visualization, but then we're more advanced and we just don't really have time to cover them in details in this module. Okay, so in this lecture, uh, I'm going to just focus on the table data set type. Okay, and um, so just very quickly, and <clears throat> in the tables, you have this concept called the keys and attributes. And actually, can I ask, can you and um, do a show of hand, click either yes or no, say, how many of you knows relational table and know what the um, key means in a relational table? Like a MySQL, yeah. Lakshana said yes. How about everyone else? Okay, Roy also said yes. Yeah. Okay. And how about Chi Two and Liban? Are you familiar with the concept of keys in a database? Okay. No. Okay. And so. The keys and values we are talking here is very similar to the, sim the concept people use in a database. And since someone don't really not aware of this, so it may be useful to explain again. And so the key is something you can use to I uniquely identify an item. And so for example, if you think of like, uh, I don't know, say, Let's say we have a table which lists all the products we have in a supermarket, and you have different attributes. So you have the product name, for example, it's called, I don't know, fizzy drinks. It has the price, and some other has the weight of the product, or maybe where they should be placed, in which aisle and which shelf. But these information are not useful, or cannot be used to uniquely identify the product. And you can also have other attributes. And for example, you have the barcode for a product. And usually the barcode is unique in the sense every product have a different barcode. And use a barcode, you can uniquely identify a product. And the barcode itself becomes the key, becomes the key for you looking at different items. And in the language of say the table data set and say the items and attributes so the key is one of the attributes that you can sorry the key is the attribute one or multiple attributes that you can use to uniquely identify an item okay and the simple ones you can have just one key as i said um, in the supermarket examples maybe just only using the barcode itself you can identify every single product then that one attribute is enough. So that's symbol. Sorry, that's a simple, and you have one key only. And uh, so you have more complicated complicated cases, and where you need more than one attribute to identify an item. And in this case, we'll call them multi-dimensional tables. Here, multi-dimensional. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, in the sense, you need multiple keys. Um, not because you have multiple attributes, and in most cases you have more than one attribute. And um, okay, and if you want to visual it and visually represent it, you can see something like this. You have two keys, and use that to identify different items. And then for each items you have different attributes, and for each attribute you have value. So um ah, and so the example I always use is and to identify a person so sometimes using name is not enough to identify a person because there could be many person you share the same name 
especially you consider all the people or the entire population of a country or a continent or even a city like a large city like uh, London and then you need other attributes to help you identify a person so maybe name and birthday or maybe even name birthday and address so in the example if you need both name and date of birth to identify a person then you have two keys basically in two attributes and in the last example if you need name date of birth and address then you are using three attributes so that's a three key and uh, table so that's the example of multiple keys okay and then the values are referring to all the other attributes which are not part of the key and if you can look at say the supermarket product you have the key which is the barcode and then you have the other attributes like the price and the weight and the positions or their locations in the store etc and these are called value here okay okay and there's many visualization techniques which are designed to show the table type of data and so the most simple one is called a scatter plot and which you probably all seen before and uh, okay can someone tell me what is the mark uh, in a scatter plot point point yeah anyone else yeah point okay yeah very good point and so by we saying it's a point in the sense you cannot have different sizes because point doesn't have dimensions but yes it's correct so it's point okay and you can you can see something similar to what i've shown here we're actually using the size of the mark to represent something as well so strictly speaking this is no longer a scat plot because the marker is no longer a point and we have a different name to differentiate this and we call these bubble chart so now each point is kind of like a bubble and can change different sizes and so this is actually strictly speaking a bubble chart okay and so in a scat plot or a bubble chart let's just say a scat plot first and what are the channels or that be used to encode data anyone is it position position because uh, the point when the mark is normally a point then we look for the Possession, yeah. I don't mm, know. Anyone wants to have a go? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, how about Tommy? Tommy, what do you think is the channels here? Um, color, size, okay. color, size, okay. position. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. I think it's I think uh, position both mentioned the position which is definitely one of the most important channels in scatter plot and if you remember and the position itself is also the most effective ones to represent values that's part of explain why scatter plot is very good at showing certain and um, data for example you want to compare <clears throat> and in this particularly example you probably cannot see but the x and y axis represents life expectancy and infant mortality that's the two values you represent and uh, we can also use color as well i think in here the color represents so each dot is actually a country and the color represents which continent the country is from and finally we have size and size is only applicable if we talk about a bubble chart where the size of these dots can also change and here the size represents the population of different countries
Okay, and uh, sometimes you can do some transformation before you actually visualize data, which can help you to show the actual underlying information or insights or patterns better. And so, and this is showing the kind of the information related to different diamond and in terms of the price and the weight, which is measured in carat. And so this is x axis shows and the weight, which is in terms of one, two, three, and four. And this side shows the price. I don't know, maybe maybe dollars or something. And then you can see roughly see the trend is as the weights increase and the price of the diamond also increases. And also you probably can say and uh, the weight. Sorry, the price increase is much faster than the weight. Because if the two is almost linear relation, you probably should see a 45 degrees line, uh, something like this. But obviously this is actually go above the line. And then the the question is how faster is the price increase compared to the carrot, the weight? For example, is that twice? So which is still linear, or is it kind of square or even cubical? That's the increase even faster than the linear, but it's still polynomial, or is it exponential? Exponential in the sense they say it's say it's the two to the power of the weight, for example. Anyone wants to have a guess? So anyone says maybe this is a uh, faster than say linear increases so maybe it's twice or three times anyone if anyone think can you click yes if you think maybe this is still linear but just more than say one times no one okay uh anyone think this is might be quadratic means a square or cubic means to the power of three Still in the body, and oh, okay, okay, we have one. So it means someone. Okay, I have Lakshana. I think it may be square or cubic. Okay, so how many people think of you? This is exponential, in the sense it says so. It says two to the power of weight or ten to ten to the power of weight. Okay, Liban think it's. Oh, okay. Chitu also think it's exponential. And uh, Roy and Tommy didn't have any. Sorry, okay. I have no idea. I'm sorry. I don't know. Uh, oh, okay, okay. <clears throat> That's okay. And then, so this is come back to. So if we do some transformation before, and you might be able to see this kind of pattern more clearly. So, mm -hmm. and what? shown here is showing uh, log scaled attributes mm -hmm. and in the sense so now I'm not increasing each axis linearly in the sense I don't go one two three and four anymore I go 10 so sorry 10 to the power of minus 0 0.6 mm -hmm. and then 10 to the power of minus 0 0.4 and so on and so forth and similarly on this side I don't go say 500, 1000, and 1000, sorry, 5000, 10,000, 15,000, etc. I go 1000, which is 10 to the power of 3, and then 10 to the power of 3.5, and then 10 to the power of 4. So essentially, and now you can see, and um, this is almost a straight line. So that means when you plot the both axes in logarithmic scale you can see almost a linear relationship between the two attributes so that means the price and the carrot actually the relationship is exponential in the sense it's two to the power of the weight or 10 to the power of the weight mm -hmm. yeah So in a sense, if you do this kind of transformation in terms of the 
unit you used on the scale and the relationship becomes clearer. Okay, and uh, yeah, and some kind of comments in terms of the scat plot. And so it can be used to show two quantitative attributes. So certainly the X and the Y axis, one can show each quantitative attributes. And the markers is the points and the two channels, which you use to show these two quantitative attributes are the horizontal and vertical positions. Okay, so it, it's good at, what is good at, you can find trends. For example, this you can clearly see, or in the previous example, you can clearly see the relationship and or the trends between the price and the weight of the diamond. And you can easily see outliers. We have example here. You can easily see probably this one is outlier, doesn't fit in, doesn't fit in. And then distribution, correlation, they are probably quite close in terms of trend. And finally, clusters. Here it's not very clear, but maybe this entire thing is one big cluster. We cannot see any further cluster inside. But scat plot is usually good to show these. And then in terms of scalability, just say how many different points you can include in the scat plot. Uh, the general guideline is maybe hundreds of them. And if you increase to thousands of them, maybe still doable, but people will be getting difficult. And to see individual dot. And if you increase this even further, then you might have the so-called overplotting problem in the sense you might have many points draw at the visualist appears to be in the same position. And as a human, you, you probably cannot tell, say, is this one, for example, one dot or 10 dot drawing at the same position? Then that can lead to some misunderstanding of the data. And so in the general, it just says, usually you, it's okay if you have hundreds of items, then it will be fine using scat plot. Okay, and um, now we introduce another, or cover or discuss another very simple or basic visualization, which is called bar chart. Okay, and now we actually can have a key. So if you remember early on, we talk about key and values. So the key are the attributes that you can use to identify um, each items in your data collection. So in this here, the key will be the species or different animals. And actually, I don't even know what this animal is. Capybara. And there's cat and there's wombat. And wombat is an Australian animal, it looks like a, I don't know, a big cat, big rat, or smaller, smaller pig, or wild pigs. But anyway, so this is the key. And so in the bar chart, and you're using one of the dimensions to represent the key, which is to identify, in this case, identify animals. And these are separated along the horizontal axis. And you can have one value. In this case, we can represent one value, which is the weight of the average weight of this type of these, these animals. So obviously, capybara is the heaviest, and the cat is the lightest, and wombat is somewhere in between. That's the weight. Okay. And in terms of mark, uh, we say the mark is the line, and some people might say it's the shape. But here we're only using the one dimension to represent, say in this case, weight. We don't use the width of the line to represent any information. So we say the mark is still line. It's a 1D mark. And in terms of channel, and it's align the vertical positions in the sense all these marks start zero position at the exact same place and use the lens to show the values. So this is one of the most effect effective channels for showing numerical data. Okay. And so here in terms of the mark itself, you can order the key and differently. And if you remember the key here, which is the animal type or animal name is what we mentioned before as a categorical attributes. 
So it is key, but it's also categorical in the sense there's no natural order between these names. So you could order, for example, alphabetically. That could be one way, which is what being done here. Or you could wait, order this by the weight. So you can impose some kind of order onto this categorical attributes. But that's really up to you. That's part of the design choice. Um, Kai, a question for you, please. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Kai, what if we have uh, a data set, you know, that has about uh, three different attributes? How do we go about displaying that on on the charts? Okay. And so first you need to look at, you have three attributes you want to show, and you need to know what are these three and what are, are their types, right? And so, for example, let's go back to the previous example. And uh, let's say if you have three attributes and two of them are quantitative or numerical, in terms of like a number, and one of them is categorical, then you can use this. So you can use X for one attribute, Y for the other one, and use the color for the categorical attribute. OK, but then let's say if your three attributes, all of them are categorical, right? then you definitely cannot use this one. And say, um, or I guess let's say maybe it's scat plot is not the best visualization for that purpose. You might be able to, you might be able to. And then what I would recommend is just go back here to see, okay, these are different attributes you can use to represent categorical attributes. And in this case, you have three. So I can use a special region to represent one, use the color to represent the second, and use the shape, for example, to represent the third category of attributes. And then you have to decide which one of these categorical attributes is most important to you. And I don't know, maybe say the animal name or type is most important. Then they're going to use this one because that's the most effective. And use this one for the second most important and use the last one for the least important. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. So, so, can, so is, is that, is, we're not, we... Sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. Three different, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Hello. Yeah. yeah, so we can't use the same colors for the, for the three different um, attributes. Can you say it again? Can you... We can, you, what you've just said right now is that we have to represent it with three different colors. So what I, my question, going back to my question, I say you've got like a data set, yeah? Yeah. You've got one data set, yeah? That has three different attributes, yeah? On that data set. Yeah. Yeah. And you now want to represent that, that those three different attributes you've got on one data set visually. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that was what I answered before. So you three have you have three attributes, you need to find three yes. channels to represent okay. one channel for each attribute and you have to decide what these three channels are gonna be. Right. Okay. Okay, okay. I'll just I'll just trying to clarify that really because I think your coursework is some is somehow related to that also too. Yeah, and I think that's the the, the main things we cover. And so the general general idea would be you depends on how many attributes you need to represent. You need to find that many number of channels to represent, and then the question. The most difficult part is to decide which channel to use for which attribute. So you want to find the one that's most effective for the type of the channel and they're still available. 
and they also say work together they don't have too much interference in interference between them we previously showed some examples for example if you use size to represent one value and when size becomes really small it's difficult to say the color or the shape of the mark then the interference you want to avoid those etc etc okay all right yeah. okay Okay, yeah. Um, so again, now just come to some general guidelines regarding to the and the bar chart. So here, and you can use that to represent one categorical attribute. In this case, it's key. It doesn't have to be, and one quantitative attribute. So it's a bit different. If you remember, for scat plot, it's good to representing two quantitative attributes but it does not have any dimensions naturally to represent categorical attributes and the markers is the line so we use the lens of the mark to represent the quantitative value and the position or here say spiritual spatial region to represent the quantitative sorry categorical value then you can do different Kind of ordering and in terms of the task that is good too so it's good for compare in the sense you can easily see the difference between say two bars even when the difference is very small if you remember previously and we compare the bar chart to pie chart we're adding the pie chart and the size difference between the sections of the pie can be difficult to see but if you represent it as a bar chart, it's very easy to see. And finally, um, in terms of scalability, you can have hundreds of these bars, or dozens of these bars will be fine, but more than that, it might start to get difficult for people to tell the different bars or fit everything into one screen. And you can have hundreds of levels for the key attributes. So if you remember, <clears throat> the levels of key attributes means if the two bars has different values, you can still visually see they are different. Then it becomes one level. As we mentioned, it's very, it can use bar chart to show very small value differences. So you can have hundreds of levels of different values and you can see easily obviously here the difference is quite big so you can see very clearly and okay so now i'm going to introduce you some different variations of um, bar chart and the first one is called a stack of the bar chart so what it does is and um, in each bar you have not just kind of one segment, uh, you can actually have multiple segments. And they stacked on top of each other. And the final height or the length of the bar depends on the length of each segment. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And then this is the part which can be slightly confusing. Uh, so in terms of the data it represents, obviously it's a bar chart, so you can definitely have one quantitative one and one categorical attribute. But here it's saying it has actually two categorical attributes. Did anyone knows why it meant by two, what are the two categorical? attribute a uh, stack of the bar chart represents anyone or does the question make sense okay so so probably not so obviously and the first categorical attributes you can represent in a stack the bar chart uh, is the position of different bars so obviously you know the first position second third and basically the x dimension can be used to represent different types or some other categorical values 
And the second categorical attribute is the segment within the bar. So is that the first, the second, third segment of your bar? That also represents another categorical attribute. Okay, let's, uh, um, how do I say? Um, okay, so let's say, and um, this is, imagine let's say this bar chart is a representing the profit of different products. Yeah. And then the X axis would represent the different products. So this is product one, maybe that's chairs, uh, that's desk, and this is computer, and this is mobile phone, etc., etc. So that's the first categorical attributes. And then within, for each product, and the different segment represents the profit of the same product, but from different areas or different cities, let's say. And so maybe the green one means the profit coming from London, and the green one is from Birmingham, uh, this dark blue one from Bristol, this is from Edinburgh, and this is from, I don't know, say from Ireland. Yeah. So the second uh, key or categorical value here is the city. Does that make sense? And then once you had both these categorical attributes, then you can say, okay, that is the profit of this product, let's say computer uh, from Dublin, which is the second categorical attribute. Does that make sense or someone want to, or is still not quite clear? Uh, sorry, I have some problem getting. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh... Sorry, um, we, we use, um, when we created, for example, the visualization in Tableau, uh, it sh clearly showed like in this bar chart, um, it showed uh, the different, uh, products like they were represented by different colors so now you when you said that it is one product like a mobile phone but shown in different countries in terms of its sales so it gets a bit confusing i didn't get it. okay um so i was saying the x axis is uh, representing product so each of these bar representing a different product. Mm -hmm. So maybe let's say the third bar represents mobile phone. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the total height, so the y axis represents, say, the pro profit for the mobile phone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you have to come to these different segments, and um, which represents for the profit of mobile phone from different cities. Uh, okay, yeah, okay, good. Yeah. So the different city here becomes the second categorical attribute. attribute. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. So if you want to show the profit of mobile phone or profit, so the profit of product from different cities, and this could be one of the way to do it. So you have two categorical attributes, which is the product oh. and the city, and you want to show them and show say one, these two categorical plus one quantitative value, which is a profit. Profit, this, yeah, yeah. yeah, very clear. Yeah, thank you, thank yeah. you, got it, thanks. Okay, I hope for, this makes sense for the others as well. Okay, um, the mark is still lying. Um, we have a, and uh, sometimes we give it a different name, call it glyph, and glyph, it's kind of a general term. So something is not a simple kind of shape, not something like either point or circle or square. It's kind of made up shape or the combination of simple shapes. We call them glyph. So in a sense, this is not just a simple rectangle or line. It's a com say a few sync lines or put together. So that's why I call it glyph. Okay.
and then these are the different channels. So we use the lens, this is the lens to represent the category, sorry, the, uh, the quantitative values, and the spatial region, which is where the bar is to represent one categorical value, and within the each bar, the position to represent a second categorical value. Okay, and so in terms of the task or what kind of situation this is good for. So part is good for when you need to understand kind of breakdown of the total value. So for example, you're interested in the total profit, but also you're interested in the profit from different cities, which is a breakdown of the total value. And this is kind of good way to show it. And this shows the part to whole. So the profit from each city in terms of how much percentage that taken um, for the entire profit. So that's the part to whole relationship. Okay, in terms of scalability, so say how many you can show at the same time without being say overwhelming or before people cannot really see it anymore. And so you can have several to 1000 levels in terms of different segmentation within each bar. And so you don't want to have say 20, 30 different segments then it will become difficult for people to keep track of, for example, and which segment here maps to uh, the segment in this bar. So you don't want to have to have more than say 10 or 15 levels. Okay, and there's here is some other variations and this one is called ranged bar chart. Um, not very common, but uh, used in sometimes. So this one is used to show the salary range of different positions. So you can see for quality assurance position, and the range is usually between 100K and 152K. And for software engineer, it's between 90 and 160K and so on. And so it's like a variation of the bar chart. And one of the main difference is it's showing a range. And these different bars, they don't start from the same place. So they don't all start with 70K or zero. It starts from where the minimum value is, ends up at the maximum value. Okay. And uh, again, this is not that common, but sometimes you see this, and uh, which is called uh, waterfall chart. What essentially it does is usually, for example, kind of counting the two sides of the same value. Uh, in this case, they were talking about and uh, the total revenue and versus the cost. And so you have this much in terms of sales and this much in terms of service. And this, when you add these two together, you have the total revenue. Does that make sense? And, in the, and, then, and then it goes to the other side of this. So then this is your revenue and you have different expenses. So this much is your research expense. This much is your marketing expense. And this is for salary. And now you have another term called operating income. So that's the amount of this much, taken out these three, which give you remaining operating income. And you can then further take out the taxes and becomes the net income. Okay, so this is actually showing the two sides, the income and expenses, and you break the income down into the sales and service, and the expenses side, you break down into different expenses plus the net income. And, okay, I might ask you something a slightly more difficult. Uh, and can you think of any way that you can represent this one differently? OK, 
Can anyone think of any other ways to represent the same data here? No? What about using a normal bar chart, Carl? Normal bar chart? Yeah. Yeah, it's also possible, but in a sense, you would have sales and the service, you might have to put it down here. If you can imagine, and then total revenue and all these went down. It's possible, and but you kind of lose the kind of visual information, say sales plus equal to total revenue. That's something slightly would be slightly harder to see when you just use a normal bar chart. All right. <clears throat> Anyone else want to give it a try? Amima? Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm, I'm not too sure. Okay. Mm. Okay. And so Kai, actually... Kai, Kai, do, we have, do we have all these charts? Do we have them on Tableau? Uh, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think, think so. you have everything on chat Tableau. Yeah. No, no. Uh, so, so actually, one potential way to do this is you can instead of say uh, waterfall charts, what it's called here, you can also potentially use. If I can go back, and something like a right. stack the bar chart. Hmm. Okay. Uh, in the sense, you can. Uh, oh, well, it's not showing. And you can have this as one bar, but it further break into two parts. And so this will be the service and that will be the sales. You have to show that in your breakdown, the different sections. And all these ones, again, you can put into one chart. You can break down into different sections in the bar. And it might be slightly difficult to show the operating income because that's again further breaking into two parts but potentially can show that in two bars if that makes sense yeah okay uh we're going to the next one and this one is called the line chart again uh it's, you are very common but actually now i'm going to ask you and um, how many attributes does it show? What type of attributes does it show? Anyone? Um, Year on average, so two. Yeah, but the, so it shows two attributes, and but what type of these attributes? Average quantitative. Okay, yeah, so. This is quantitative. What about this size? Is it quantitative or categorical or? Shoes by numbers, yeah. of course. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. It's quantitative. Yeah, so it's, yeah. yeah. So in that sense, it's quite similar to a scat plot. It's also have two, basically two quantitative attributes using the two axis, which is different than the bar chart where you have one categorical and one quantitative. And uh, you have points and then line connecting the points. And uh, yeah, in terms of the channel, so the position of these points and then to show the quantitative value and then these lines are usually to highlight the trend. So that's what it's good for, is to highlighting the trend. That's why it's different in terms compared to scatter plot. Okay, and then here gives us to show a very simple example. So you can show exactly the same data using different types of the chart, just based on the visual channels you use to represent the attributes and you can show quite different messages. Okay, and so for example, 
you can say comparing, let's say, the average height between the male and female, say, students in the class. So on average, and the male, sorry, the female is about 45 inches and the male is about 55 inches. Okay. And you can potentially using a bar chart and you can also using line chart doing something like this. And then the question is, uh, which one would be better? So let's imagine, say, this is exactly the same data, but instead of, like, say, 10 years old, 12 years old, this is still female and male. So the data is exactly the same between these two charts. And But which one do you think is a better validation? The first one, bar chart, is very clear. Very clear. Uh, any other reasons you think this one is better? Oh, well. Okay. Lakshana, it, do you have any comment? Um, I feel like the uh, bar chart is better because it, it illustrates the, um, the category the category better because obviously with the 10 year old and the 12 year old you can't differentiate whether they're by the categories so i feel like the bar chart shows a better approach okay okay yeah and um, so it seems like a consensus or and the bar chart is better and but uh, the reason will more like say and the bar chart encourages comparison, which is what you're good at. You can see the difference between the two categories, male and female, whereas the line chart was really meant to, to see the trend. And so you could do this and you can say, I still do the same and I draw that data using a line chart, but this does not make any sense in terms of between the genders that doesn't the trend of the height between genders does not really make sense. Whereas if you want to show the difference between the average height of genders might make sense. And then this one, both could make sense, depends on what you want to show. So you can show the height of the 12 years old and the 10 years old, the difference. So you can show you this one to show the difference, say, and this is how much the difference between the two, uh, the uh, sorry, the age group. And you can use this one to show the general trend. So you might want to say, if you want to show the trend is as you grow older, uh, the height increases, but it say stops at a certain age, maybe after 18, the height no longer changes. And then this will make more sense used as the line chart. Yeah, and so it's whether the bar chart or line chart is better with depending on the information you want to show. If it's comparison, then bar chart will be better. And if it's showing the trend, then line, line chart will be better. It depends on what you really want to show. And if you use the, the other type, then it will be less effective. For example, if you want to show comparison, but you use the line chart, still it's still possible but it will be less effective and less useful validation okay uh, these are some other variations of the line chart and uh, so this is sometimes you see and this is these ones you have to be really careful and can anyone see the difference here? How is that different from normal line chart? And Tommy? Hello, Tommy, are you there? Maybe not. Hello, and can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Is actually is actually describing the number of visitors that have actually visited the website with regards to the traffic and um, the and the dates they actually um, 
the, 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 the dates, they actually reset that website. And But uh, can you see any difference between this one and, the, say, the normal line chart we shown before? Any difference? This, um, this has points on it. And um, shows yes. more values. Okay, the so it was only between two attributes. Sorry, can you say it again, mm. uh, Roya? The, the difference is that the first one that you showed us that was like between the like comparison between the two. Mm -hmm attributes which was a little bit easy whereas in this one there are quite a lot like ah okay yeah so you have more points basically more points yeah along the line okay yeah so those are all differences but i think the more major difference is and if you look at the y-axis and it starts with 600 800 1000 this one usually should be 1200 usually but it actually jumped to, to 1800 and then 2000 mm -hmm. okay so you just have to be careful so actually the graph should go instead of going here it probably should go very high up here and then come down and then go here and they kind of cut out some space in between so they can use less space to display the chart but also that might mislead actually in terms of difference between this point and this point. So if you just look at this, you might see, okay, the difference might be 200 between these two, or maybe say a little bit more than one line, but actually the difference is way bigger than that. So something you have to be quite careful. Okay. Uh, so I guess this is simple in the sense the difference here is you can have multiple lines. So you don't have to only have one line within in your chart. But the part then you can you have to be careful is there's different scales, say here, and the football, the order and the revenue, they all have different scales. So the value is not different. So sometimes you want to make sure the scales are the same in terms of, okay, and it's always from zero to 100. And then the relative position between these lines will be different compared to this. So sometimes you want to do this way is you can compare the shapes of this line better. So you can imagine if they are on the same scale, then the blue will be stay here, and both the red and purple one will be much down here, like halfway down at least here. Then it will be maybe more difficult to compare the shapes between them. Yeah. So again, it depends on what you want to see. If you're more important is absolute value, then you probably want to have the same scales, Y scales, for all the line series, and if you want to compare the shapes of the lines, and maybe this will be better. Yeah. Sorry, one question. Is yeah. for, is for this particular one, line chart, can we use a bar chart with different colors, like the red, the purple, and the light blue? Uh, don't you think that will also be like a clear? Um, okay. Can anyone answer Roya's question? So the question is, if we use a bar chart here instead of line chart, what difference would that make? Would that bar chart be a better choice or not? Um, we said when for the larger values, you can't use a uh, bar chart will take long space. But uh, in this particular case, uh, but if we have like bar chart there yeah, in red and then purple and, one. Yeah. yeah. Liban, what do you think? I think um, in terms of a bar chart, I think it'd be uh, in terms of comprehending the data, I think it'd be better to use a bar chart, in my opinion. I don't know. I might be wrong. Um, but, but why do you think that's the case? Because um, they're, they're a lot more easier to, to understand, I think. 
but with this one you have like these lines going you know you know all over the place and it might be a bit harder to comprehend but that's just my opinion that's just what i think so okay uh anyone else um tommy tommy are you there now i mean isn't a line graph better to show trends over yeah. time which is mm -hmm. what this one is so you think uh, um, line graph will be better i mean in terms of showing trends over time yes mm. um i'm not entirely sure whether it'd be better or not oh uh, okay okay yeah so and i personally would think line chart would again it depends on what you want to show so i assume if it's it's showing the trend over time for example you want to see show there's always a season seasonal pattern so you have end of year sales which is very high for example and then line chart is probably better and also and line so if you use bar chart is mainly for comparison so if you want to highlight the difference of these three different values maybe a line a bar chart will be better okay yeah mm. i see okay yeah but okay. say if we want to show trend then bar chart might not be that easy to see especially when you have to say draw three bars for each of these products like one for each it might be difficult to see the overall trend that clearly okay mm. okay uh i guess yeah I think we are okay. So I'll just show you some other common variations of different line charts. And this one is called a spy line, a spline line chart. And really it's just instead of using these straight line segment between the points and it use a curved line. So that kind of to make the line more continuous. And some people prefer this one a little bit better. Other people perform the straight line better and so i don't see any big difference in terms of realization for these two okay and this is another maybe less common line chart is using the step line so instead of using one line connecting between the points it is can be more than one but it's always horizontal or vertical and so then can have and uh, say this value go up and then go down and then go up again and it can potentially have a few options for example and between the second and third point and you have the options to go follow the previous value all the way and then change here or you can change here and then go the way there okay a few different options And then also, this is quite common as well, area chart, in the sense you still have the normal line chart, but they color the areas and below the line. And uh, okay, and there's, and sometimes it can be and slightly confusing because you can have also this one, and which is a stacked area chart. So visually, uh, you can see they are both they have two lines in the realization but uh, the difference is in here and the value for the these kind of red, red points and the value is actually not between where it is so for this one its value is not 100 let's say 130k or 135k but instead it's this much uh, which is about 50k, if that makes sense. So that's why it's called a stacked area chart. Whereas in this one, um, the value here is just say the distance represented by distance between here and the baseline. So this will be 150 roughly, 160, etc. Not the distance between this line and the, the this point and the blue line. Does that make sense? So that's something you need to make it clear if you're using something visualization like this, area chart.
Okay, and this is something a little bit more complicated. Uh, so it's something called a horizontal chart, and it is used to make the chart or a line chart as compact as possible. So this is the line chart, normal line chart we have. So it takes up quite a bit of space. We cannot do too much in terms of the width, but we can do something about the height. Okay, so first what you do is you, okay, you can break this uh, horizontal, sorry, vertical values into a few segments. So you have this part, which is below the line, and these parts is like the first segment above the line, the second and third, and you represent it using different colors. So for all the part that below the baseline will be purple, and above the baseline will be orange and depends on how much above you have different levels of orange. So the first level will have the lightest orange, next one have a darker orange or more orange, orange, and then the top level would have the most saturated orange or the most orange orange. Okay, so so far is not that interesting, but what you can do you can then flip the part below the baseline. So instead of drawing them below, you draw them up now. But because this color is different, then you know that's actually below. And for all these segments, which are higher than the first, you move them down. And so this part is now moved down, and you draw like this. You can see. The second shade of orange is where you draw it now. And this is even higher value, and then you draw it here. And then there's a very top with the largest or deepest orange color, and it was here, moved on. Okay, and uh, so as you can see, it still represents the same information as this one, but it used like a quarter of the space. So basically, the height was divided into four parts. Now it only used one part to display the same amount of information. So it reduced the space to a quarter. And uh, actually, can I have a show of hands just and quickly? Do you think this kind of validation, the horizontal chart, is in intuitive in the sense it's easy for you to understand? Can you click yes if you think it is, or no, it isn't? No? Okay. Anyone else have opinion? Okay, Chi, do you think it's okay? Amima, Liban, and uh, Roya, do you want to? Oh, okay, Roya said no, it's not intuitive. Okay, and so I guess that we have more people saying no than yes. And that's indeed the case. So. Uh, so this new validation, you always have a kind of learning phase. And so you will need to give people some time to get used to it. So, and actually people who come up with this idea, do some experiment, they find you give, after giving people some brief training, maybe say 10, 15 minutes, and their performance using this chart is the same as you use using this chart. Does that make sense? And once you get used to it, and how you, uh, this validation is probably as good as this validation. And in a sense, that's very good uh, news because then that means you can display much more in the same amount of space. So here is showing the stock price of some big names companies in the American stock market using this validation. So you can see quite easily Say the first one is Apple, it's all red, that means it's probably losing all the time. And you can easily see where it's losing more compared to overall. Whereas the other ones are blue, and you can see where they are increasing. Yeah. And because of using this kind of visual representation, you can represent one, two, three, four, five. So about 10 of these. And but 
if you use this type of validation, you might only be able to and display two or three, so in the same amount of space. Okay. Okay, and uh, this is the second last one. Is another type of, and um, maybe, maybe this is probably more common than the horizontal chart. And uh, so this is essentially a still stack the bar chart, but it's usually called string graph. <clears throat> so, or maybe the closest thing you get for that one is actually this, and uh, stack the line chart, or stack the area chart, and you have different colored sections. One is stacked on, on top of each other, but in that particular stream graph, and uh, the the bottom line is not flat. It's not like the zero here. It changes, so that's why you have something like this. Then you have different these different band uh, within your stack the bar chart, but the bottom is not always flat. It can change. So you focus on the continuity but you can still easily see where which part of the which band has the largest values and you can also see the color i think this is run okay i think this is you probably can't see the text there this is representing the popularity of different bands and the color represents the type of music and uh I don't really re recognize all the names there, but uh, say this one, it says 40 Winks. Maybe that's a band which is very popular back in that time. It's a long time ago. And here, the blue ones, you have Daft Punk, which essentially, I assume that means electronic music here. Okay. Uh, finally, oh, ah, this just show you quickly uh, the animation between oh, different types of line charts. So that's the normal line chart, and this is how it changed to horizontal or stack that becomes stream graph. Yeah. So that's changing between a few ones and some new ones we didn't cover. Okay, the last one is a bar chart. Ah, oh, they have a bit more as well. So you can represent very similar data sets using different types of charts, even between the line and bar chart. And different ones will have different, uh, it's good for showing different type of patterns or information in your data set. Okay. Oh. And, uh, and that's it. I think, uh, so in terms of reading and this week we covered the uh, chapter seven of the textbook. And so that's will be the reading for this week. And so later on, in the lab this week, we're going to talk more about the first coursework, the individual part. And do you have a look of the requirements? We're going to go through that in the lab. But also, if you have some questions, I can also ask, uh, answer them then. Yeah. OK, and that's it for today. Thank you. Thank you.